Welcome back, everybody. I hope you had a restful lunch and uh, enriching conversations um, in the uh, in the lounge. Um, this afternoon, I welcome you to the first of several keynotes in this conference, and we're looking forward to engaging uh, with you and the speaker. I have the pleasure to introduce Dr. Kole Ade Odotula, who completed his PhD in Media Studies uh, from Rutgers University. Kole joined the University of uh, Florida in 2006, where he is now a senior lecturer in the Department of Languages, Literatures and Cultures in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. Here he teaches Yoruba language and cultures, as well as area studies courses which focus on the African continent. Recently, for example, he taught a course titled The United Tastes of uh, Slash in America, in which students cooked and ate meals from different cultures. Previously, Kole worked for many years as a, as a photojournalist in Nigeria and was also a cultural activist interested in using culture as an effective means of mass mobilization. The multi-talented uh, Kole is also a poet uh, with three poetry collections under his name. He was invited to the 12th Poetry Festival in Durban, um, in our country, and was one of the invited participants at the Welcome Trust um, Telling Stories for Public Engagement Workshop, which took place in Bangalore, India. So he's bringing us all together, those of us who are participating from different continents. His book on the diaspora and imagined nationality was published in 2012 by Carolina um, Academic Press. Unsurprisingly, Kole loves cooking and tasting meals from different cultures and fighting for environmental justice. This afternoon, Kole is speaking to us on the topic of good food and the, and the body. Over to you, uh, Kole. Okay, thank you very much for that introduction. And I will just um, delve in straight to my paper. Uh, but first, let me whet your appetite by showing you pictures of meals I would have prepared for you if this were face to face. And you would have also enjoyed the smell and the texture of these meals. Um, the title says different kinds of Yoruba foods, and you have amala and um, vegetable. You have vegetable stew, which we call obefo, and you have okra, which we call obela, and you have uh, moi moi. Um, later on, I shall delve into what is circulating around. So, onjerere, lawara. I have modified the title a little. Onjerere, Lawara, good food and its effect on the body. Digging into the large pot of Yoruba culture from the local to the global. Sp speaking in a local language to an international gathering may be a sure way of losing a sizable number of my listeners. But if knowledge in any form is to be meaningful should it not come from an inherited body of knowledge i make no pretenses to a robust accusation of western and dominant epistemology you would indulge me to wear my yoruba identity as a badge of honor the good thing is that i am not the only one standing on an ethnic pedestal to pontificate. I'm in the good company of scholars like Shari Dyer and her exposition on good food in South Africa. Never mind that her gaze is national, 
while mine is from one of the sub-nationalities in Nigeria. Our storms may be different, but Sarah Nikijova's paper on, and I quote, the edible woman, ethno-linguistic reflections on names of Kiganda food, end of quote, cuts close to the bone of my presentation. The reason why I decided on the meat of this presentation has to do with my first encounter with food as nourishment and medicine. That encounter comes from my large family home port and hot stories from friends. On that premise, you would allow me to share with you what I know in its raw form about cooking, eating, drinking, snacking, and the re-engineering of leftovers. Okay. The pertinent question will then be, how among the Yoruba people and their culture is good food defined? In addition, by what parameters does the society measure the effect of good food on the body? Explorations in lieu of answers to these rhetorical questions will be provided by looking into Yoruba proverbs and also by asking members of the community what they can reconstruct from their youth. Leaving behind the local, I will take you on a very brief journey of a story behind a course I developed as an immigrant in an, in an academy in the United States of America. A part of my presentation will speak at some point to a type of tate of Murumulo, Murumubo, and finally Murumulu. These three-way modes of knowledge transportation, consumption, and appropriation we speak to my sojourn in Western Academy in relation to how I designed that course. We termed United Tastes of Slash in America. In effect, a part of my interest in this key note is to present how food and its attendant transnational cultures are taught in some institutions in the United States. I will share results of my casual outcome on what goes into the slabos and maybe by chance deduce what is omitted. The examination of what others teach and how they conduct their classes gives me the opportunity to share how the course was developed. In time, if time permits, and to give a multicultural dimension to my presentation. I will present you with a second-hand review of a traveling exhibition titled Food of War. As a way to construct an intersection between artistic practice and cultural studies. According to the creators, and I quote, Food effectively dissolves most preconceived distinctions between nature and culture, production and consumption, morals and markets, family and society, the individual and the collective body and mind. End of quote. If we must start from the very beginning, I'm sure you would want me to restate why I have decided on taking my raw materials for this keynote directly from the Yoruba language and culture. When there are more than enough materials from conventional scholars who have carried out empirical studies on food from Africa's perspectives using Western lenses. For instance, Ogundele in 2006 would want us to believe that, and I quote, the gastronomic behavior of Yoruba people evolved as a result of a tangled web 
of several relationships involving such phenomena as the transatlantic trade and colonization, end of quote. It is true that one should not consider Yoruba people without a thought to the Yoruba in the diaspora. I plead your indulgence to leave out the diaspora for now and focus on the Yoruba of the South Western Nigeria. My reason is simple. Because of the depth of knowledge locked in our various languages, someone needs to re-engage an international audience such as this. It has become imperative to unlock these knowledge by interpreting them for other Africans and the rest of the world. In response to the question of the criteria Yoruba people use for determining what constitutes good food, it is to Yoruba proverbs and songs we must turn. I have an authority that one from one of, from what one of the community leaders who responded to a few of my questions posed to her had to say. In response to the question of how Yoruba people determine good food, she said, amongst the Yoruba, good food is judged by one, pleasant taste, the fillings on the taste boards, and the nutritional value of the food constituents the food constituents have. As subjective, universal, and non-empirical, this response may appear at first. It speaks to the shared value and commonality of Yoruba people. According to Informed Health Org in 2011, it says there's a strong link between taste and emotion and that the nexus is evolutionary. In other words, and I quote, taste was a sense that aided us in tasting the food we were consuming. It was therefore a, a matter of survival. A bitter or sour taste was an indication of poisonous inedible plants or a rotten protein rich food. The tastes Sweets and salty, on the other hand, are often a sign of rich in nutrients. End of quote. What is still left unsaid is how to calibrate the sensational emotion. As you all know, self-reporting of emotion can be problematic, especially if the culture lacks adequate expressions to convey meaning transculturally. If language can be a bearer of meaning, then there are words within the Yoruba lexicon used when talking about the taste of a meal. When it is delicious, we press into service a verb such as doom. When it is sour, we say okon. In addition, there are words to convey sensations such as bitter, we say okoro. And koro, as bitterness, also has its own degrees. It begins to acquire similes. Okoro bi jobo. Jobo is a very bitter thing. And there are also proverbs that go with these words, when you eat the walnut, it is sweet initially, but when you drink water, it becomes bitter. So, we say, So there are things that within the culture, they have found ways of communicating emotions. And one of the things that you should also know about the Yoruba people is that every emotion that you have in the world is egocentric. It has to be through the body. 
when people are happy, they say to themselves, Inu me do. Meaning that my inside is delicious. That is our own expression of happiness. When somebody is sad or sorrowful, we say, Inu me baje, meaning that my inside is spoiled. So the sensations and the words we use for food, you also find them in the expression of emotions. To those who have had encounters with Yoruba cuisine, you'll be aware that habanero pepper is a constant feature in most dishes. At such instances, the expression will be something like a sophomore attempt at translation would be that the pepper in the stew or soup was well cooked and it turned out not to be too spicy. The pepper also made its way into the beef. There are stews categorized as draw soup among Yoruba people. But when it made its way into the United States of America, the students described it as slimy. To us, it draws, and that is why the quality of a good draw soup, like the green vegetable, is said to draw. It will do na your meaning it retained its green color and also draws. Now, if we leave the language of description alone, another respondent stated her contribution by saying, Yoruba bo, money onje lorea wo. A simple translation would be good food in Yoruba land is what you eat or drink that can benefit your health or the friend of your complexion, growth, beauty, and longevity through the cradle to the old. End of quote. To corroborate the respondent's take, and Allen in 2015 stated, and I quote, what is eaten by Yoruba arises out of and is integral to to it. She goes on to quote Sibitelio, who states, and it's a fairly long um, quotation. You, I, will, I will beg your intelligence to go through it. Meals are one course, that is Yoruba meals, one pot stews, often thickened with peanuts. Palm oil is a standard fat. The staple is fufu, made from cassava, maize, yams, plantain, or rice, pounded and mashed, then boiled, steamed, baked, or fried. Chicken is the most valuable meal, but snails are eaten more often. Game meat is also eaten. Adovac, Eland, a large antelope, venison, ostrich, gazelle, hippopotamus, giraffe, crocodile, a seven pound fro frog, rat and bat end of quote i must dissociate myself from some of these um animals that have been mentioned in all my growing up years i have never seen a yoruba family eating a bat i don't even know whether hippopotamus has ever been on a meal but what people see from outside is always different from what is happening inside. 
If we move from the palate to one of the visible effects of good nutritious food, we soon will notice that the skin is one of the indicators. In the words of one of the respondents, and I quote, in the Yoruba culture, people who eat good food do not grow fat. They look and feel healthy. Their skins glow and they are very active people, end of quote. The operative words in the response is that they're very active people and not sedentary. It should come across that the new ways of living is not in sync with the Yoruba people, with what the Yoruba people like to eat, and the after effect of their consumption. In Yoruba culture, we have sayings such as adumadon, meaning a dark and shiny person. To give flesh to the initial ideas, the first respondent sent eight expressions in Yoruba, each pointing to either the nature of food or its component parts. To be sure, the speakers have a firm grip of succinct language to describe the texture of meals cooked. So when you hear amalana bono feli feli koniko kokon kon osi fele bieti the speaker is informing you that the meal made from dried yam flour is very very hot and it has no lumps and it, it is paper thin as a cartilage of the ears. Another example states, Iyona aro da koniko kurara. Here the speaker is talking about the texture of a pounded yam and that it has no lumps whatsoever. The linguistic description points to the aftermath of cooking and preparation of meals. Therefore, what are the rituals of cooking among Yoruba people in rural areas where the women cook on three stone stoves at the Rometa? And we have a proverb that says, at the Rometa Kidobenu. It is the stability of it. And the numerology of three will be seen and heard in three way crossroads in the loop between the living and the dead and the unborn and the the past the present and the future but the three stone stove is a symbol is symbolic of stability in therefore we should also interrogate what are the rituals of cooking among Yoruba people in rural areas where the women cook on three stone stoves or charcoal powered stoves. Some even have gone on to use sawdust, well compacted. Whereas in cities, most homes cook with kerosene stoves or liquid, uh, liquefied gas powered cookers. The environmental implication of these sources of fuel needs to be elaborated upon, but for another time. However, at the point of cooking, gender distribution of roles becomes very evident. In most homes, women are the ones who do the cooking, but men are the farmers who bring the game and produce home. The hint here is in complementarity. There is um, a social change agent in Nigeria called Mrs. Bisi Oguleye. She would always remind us, In translation, a man sees a snake, a woman sees a snake. Who cares? What we care about is for the snake not to do any harm. 
But Akikana, Jewett, and Clifford in 2018 took a look at factors shaping fuel choices and cooking practices in Nigeria. They submit, and I quote, Fuel, wood fuel remains the most widely used domestic fuel among resource poor groups in many low income countries. Despite the environmental and health problems associated with exposure to wood smoke, end of smoke, uh, quote, it is true that some cooking spaces are poorly ventilated. But majority of Yoruba women cook in open spaces. The type of wood that is used is carefully selected because some meals taste better with such smoke coming from that kind of wood. For instance, smoke fish requires a particular kind of wood to bring out its hidden, hidden taste. The science of the mixture of smoke and protein is unknown to me, but I have it on good authority that, and I quote, fish contains most of the important essential amino acids, particularly lysine, methionine, and tryptophan that are lacking in plant proteins, end of quote. This is from Akimomi and Adegbenbe in 2015. Since there is no need preaching to the choir, I need not detain you with the connection between a meal and its presentation. If you stay around a Yoruba family long enough, you would hear them say, Ojuni, Omo, Omution, Yonu. Translation. It is the judge the judgment of what satisfies the stomach is from the eyes. Or it is the judgment of the eye that gauges what will satisfy the stomach. In most Yoruba languages, in most Yoruba language learning textbooks, it is always stated that Yoruba people hardly measure ingredients while cooking. Most women gauge the appropriate amount from experience. Cookbooks, as far as the Yoruba women are concerned, are mostly for documentation or for anthropologists who are interested in studying the cooking habits of local people. Akitana, Joet, and Clifford in 2018 have about five pages on how different meals are prepared. Before concluding this presentation, this segment of the presentation, it is pertinent to recount a story I was told about the peculiar ways Yoruba people eat. The respondent talked about ritual and drama around eating good food in Yoruba land. He said he used to know a Baba Beji, father of twins, in those days, who literally conversed with every brokoto. These are a tribe and inners, every brokoto and shaki in the soup. He did this both as pleasant fun and as a tribute to the expert hand of the Iyawo, the wife, who cooked the stew. The story continued that sometimes he called the bluff of a shaki, inard of a domestic animal, that tries to intimidate with its size, or the fish head that looks menacingly at him, promising that its attempt to intimidate would succumb to his first bite, and so on and so forth. This father of twins, Baba Beji, used to say, elders is that kind of pre-start drama in the villages where he grew up in Owo, in southwestern Nigeria. As anecdotal as the story may sound, 
it would not be surprising that Yoruba people in their animist belief system think inanimate things have ears. While I was growing up, if you saw um, an, an insect, we grew up to say that we can have a conversation to stop that insect in its track. And you would hear young boys say, these were things that we did not even realize that the power in our voice and the energy that goes from our mouth to those objects could actually do something. The kind of greetings before, during, and after eating may also provide a good clue to Baba Ebeji's peculiar pre-start practice. Though greetings among Yoruba people are, and I quote, an integral part of interactional discourse and serve as prelude to the establishment of social relationship, end of quote. Akindele in 1990. There are greetings that are supplications to the mythical deity of the throat. Awenu, muwa muwa, ni awenu, muwa muwa, la wenu, muyola no konte toni, muyola no konte toni, that the deity of the throat calls that we bring and bring, and that I was satisfied yesterday has no business with today's hunger. So there are there are greetings that are supplic uh, there are supplications, there are prayers. In Yoruba, when you meet somebody eating, there are various greetings, but I have just picked out one, and it goes like this: Agbaibiri, Asibairo Labo. What that means is that the food will go through the right channel and will come out with tomorrow's passengers. There are a few other forms of greetings and responses when it comes to food. Just as there are greetings that wish the consumer well, there are also taboos surrounding food. i just give one brief one before I play you a video of how to prepare one of the of the delicacies so i'm sure jackie is getting ready children one of the taboos children for instance are i quote encouraged to sit down and eat properly at meal times they will be told that eating standing will cause the food to go straight to their legs as no child wants fat legs and an empty stomach, they will be quick to comply. End of quote. This is from Olajide in 2012. So before I go into drinks and drinking, let it not be that it is all talk. When it is food, it's supposed to be experienced. If I cannot feed your stomach, I want to feed your eyes with this video. Can we have the video, please? To make the dough, you need plantains. All right. So I'm sure now that you've had your fill of the fried plantain, um, it should be time to talk about drinks and um, drinking. In the usual practice of Yoruba people, there are panegyrics for the drinking of water in comparison to alcohol. The panegyrics is in Yoruba, but the author also translated it. Water differs not from alcohol. 
There is no alcohol without water. The mother that begat the cloth begat the apparel. Still, it remains the same one that begat the pair of trousers. End of quote. This is from Adeleke, 2017. The panegyrics may appear to suggest that there's an equivalency between water and alcohol. My guess would be that water is the most prominent liquid during meals, take, eat, during meals eaten by Yoruba people. In most rural settings, a calabash full of palm wine, known as emu, accompanies most meals, especially during lunch or dinner. The addictive potential and ability to intoxicate notwithstanding, there are documented evidences of the health benefits of palm wine. In addition, palm wine is served during both secular and sacred ceremonies. However, pap made from corn is a common feature at most breakfasts. Most folks like it hot, especially during the cold seasons. Now, having done the food, the drinks, we have something called the snacks. And our snacks are not as unhealthy as what you find in the West. The name for snacks in Yoruba is called ikpanu or munuro something to hold the space in the stomach while the food is getting ready. The Yoruba expression for snacks says a lot about its positioning among foods. There is, there is a well-known saying that pounded yam is a real food. Dried and milled yam flour is like drugs. The unavailability of these two meals necess necessitates eating fermented corn meal. Popcorn is merely eaten as snacks. There are a number of snacks apart from popcorn. There is a snack made from melon seed oil called robo and i quote once the oil is extracted from the seeds the residual crushed or ground seeds which is high in protein are seasoned and formed into little balls which are then deep fried your robo snack is ready they are similar to the granite cake made in the north of Nigeria called Kulikuli. A version exists combined with beans that is known as Igbalo. They taste extremely naughty. At first crack bite, one gets toasted peanut flavor. Then the heat follows. There is also Adu made from ground corn and palm oil. There's no way in which I would leave Yoruba meals without talking about left leftovers. If we, if the uh, PowerPoint is ready, you can just flash it, just keep on moving. You would get onto a point where it it's projects the name Ajeku. Ajeku is leftover something that you have eaten and remains. Just keep moving it, please, to the next one and to the next one. Okay, all right. So that is the, the this is what we call leftover, ajeku. Um, and there are two versions of, of leftover foods. One is food left over by elders for children. This is one treat most Yoruba children look forward to. But should an elder eat all the food in his plate, it is said that he or she 
will be responsible for washing the plate. I told them what I weigh in. There is also what is referred to as the bottom pot or the bottom of a pot. That is a delicacy for most children. The implication of a jeku or bottom pot is that nothing is allowed to waste. In fact, the remaking of leftover meals has almost become a culinary art in itself. If I were allowed to make one intellectual guess as to the origin of jollof rice, that has become a friendly bragging issue among West Africans. I would surmise that the meal came because of re-engineering food leftovers. As you may know, Jollof rice is a spiced dish simmered in reduced tomatoes, onions, peppers, and different seasonings depending on where it is made. It is now an iconic dish with massive regional significance across West Africa and a staple in celebratory social gatherings. End of quote. Now, I need to point your attention to a concern by scholars that is going around. And I have avoided to a great extent what this is saying. As I draw a curtain on Yoruba foods, I should also draw your attention to a notice making the rounds about translating Yoruba foods into English. And they say Akara is not bean cake. Moemoe is not bean pudding. Abata is not African salad. Gari is not cassava flakes or flour. Akamu is not pan. Eba is not baked cassava flour. They now tell us respect our culture and stop translating the names of our cuisines into what you don't know. And they go on to say, um, after all, you buy pizza and spaghetti, which are Italian names, and you call it with the Italian names. So why not leave our uh, Akara and Moemue to bear the original names so it can tell where it originated from anytime foreigners see them. If a friend from US or UK asks you what you had for breakfast, lunch or dinner, tell him or her you had Eba or Akara and Akam. And if they don't know it, let them Google about it. After all, that's also how we Africans read about their cuisines on the internet. Telling them you had bean cake or pap doesn't mean you are exposed and educated. It only shows how inferior you take yourself and your heritage. This is something that is going on, and I just thought I mentioned it. I don't know how much time I have because this is um, one part. If, if there's still more time, I can go on to um, the second part. Um, uh, Kole, uh, we only have about 10 minutes left in the session. So perhaps uh, you want to wrap up so that we can engage the audience a little bit? Okay. I, I, I think because this is... Uh, a comfortable point. This is all about the Yoruba food. The rest is how I developed the class. And I can only, if there's a question, I can always um, attend to that. Thank you very much for that uh, engaging, powerful um, uh, presentation, Godley. You raise 
a number of number important of issues, issues, one of which one is uh, the, the role of uh, language and the hegemony of English implicit within, within that. Um, one question is from uh, Vasu, who um, wants you to speak a little bit about what you said earlier. You eat with your eyes, and if I cannot feed your stomach, I want to feed your eyes. And um, those are powerful expressions that seem to um, travel across all cultures when it comes to eating. Um, and Vasu is asking whether you could explain that further. Yes, um, the, the Yoruba idea, and, I, and I'm sure most of the African um, cultures also have that. We don't use um, recipe books and cookbooks. We cook from experience. Mother has done it. And according to the stories in the language learning books, the daughters are supposed to be watching. But when I was growing up, um, my mother has four boys and one one um, woman now. And um, I had to do all the cutting of the pepper and the washing or whatever. So I, I paid attention to my mom. And as soon as I'm done with my mom, who I wouldn't say is a fantastic cook compared with my grandmother. My grandmother was a fantastic cook and it was from her I learned a lot of the secrets of, of cooking. And in fact, even some of the things that might sound deceptive, she would tell you if you're a married woman and your husband is at home and wants to eat something and you're not ready, fry, put the um, oil, let it heat up and throw onions into it that the whole house will be filled with it and he will think that the food will soon come. Those were some of the things I learned from her. She was the one who told me, if, if somebody asks you a question, especially a female, just repeat what you have been asked and that is the answer for it. Where are we eating tonight? The answer is, where are we eating tonight? Oh. And then, because the person who asked you that already had an answer. So this was, these were some of the things I picked up watching her cook. So it was not just the experience of watching, it was also lessons that came from it. Um, I have a question, maybe they are still coming, uh, but I have a question of my own um, while I wait for the audience. Uh, you speak eloquently about um, uh, uh, the way food travels from um, its or, or, or place of origin and with it the language that, that communicates about it. Um, in your experience uh, from the Yoruba culture, um, what do you think and you spoke a little bit about this. What do you think we lose, um, for example, linked to the very rich Yoruba proverbs when um, we uh, uh, transport food and the language across, for example, across oceans? Well, there are two sides of what we lose and what we gain. Um, I, 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 would, I, would, I would say because you are away from your own cultural milieu there is a tendency to pay more attention to details especially when it comes to language there is a, i can demonstrate for you very quickly here because i was outside of a country and when the food traveled and the name so we have what is called oka oka is a generic name for everything that you would like muscles that you put in your mouth and if you look at the layers, at the topmost part of it is pounded yam. Pounded yam is inyo. And the tone for inyo is re, mi. So there's a mark that goes up. Then there is fufu. Fufu is very light. Fufu is very light. And the tone mark on fufu is do, mi which means it goes up like this and it, it's like it opens up. 
Now, the father of them all, in terms of his heaviness, is called Eba. It has a subdot, and the tone marks are down down. When you eat Eba, you couldn't probably go to work after that. You would probably go to sleep. So when this when these meals travel out with their names, the people who brought them tend to look at it in a different way. You gain something. You also lose something in terms of having a conversation about the meal. Usually, you now enter into a new linguistic environment that does not have the kind of respect in terms of name calling of the food you're eating. You now have to use what they use. I mean, it, it's so offensive to me to hear an American student say that the okra soup is slimy. To me, that's slime. That's like something in the gutter. But for me, all it's that uh, it draws, and you would almost see that line as it as it goes. It's like a lubricant. When you put it in, you you wrap it up like this. It has a style. And you take it up like this, and it goes in there. You, some people just swallow it, but I chew mine. And then the, the drawness would help it go safely to where it's going. So in, in, in the question, I can see many dimensions to it, the loss and the gain, particularly for a, a scholar who is interested in language. There's a, there's a question that has just come up uh, from Kemi Oyebanji. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Odutola, for an informative session. You have raised very important points about the value of our food and its heritage. For instance, snacks um, or ipanu. My question is, due to modernization, how can we continue to salvage our rich African culture in this regard? so that we do not lose it completely. That is why we, in most um, diaspora communities, food festivals have now become a permanent feature. And um, it's one of the things that brought about the class I started to teach and feed them um, Yoruba food. I would not lie to you, they did not like it. I mean, you saw people taking it with one hand and look, look. So it's like, oh, 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 this is. But when it came to the European food, oh, they devoured it. In fact, they asked for more. And um, the story I tell everybody is about a student who missed a session and had kept some in the fridge, in the refrigerator. And she came just so that she had grade does not drop and said, oh, I would like to taste the food my my classmates ate. And I dished some and I put it in the microwave oven and I left. And um, by the time I went back, I looked into the into the trash bin. 97% of what I served there was there. But when I got a report the by email, she praised the food, how delicious it was. And I sent back one line or two that yes, the trash bean tells, says how delicious it, it really was. But this is this is what you you encounter with teenagers. You know they don't want to get out of their comfort zone, and um, so we have food festivals to preserve some of this. You know that um, in fact a, a group um, a group of friends just took themselves off in in London to go and and eat what they call um, abula. This, this, this is um, a local delicacy. And the whole group went to, to the place. And th these are things that we're beginning to see now. You know, people are coming up with different ideas, you know, to engage our, our local food. And if you see in the parties that the diasporans are having, they're bringing back uh, Gary and Epa, right there at big parties. 
they're bringing in big vats to make a hot amala. So um, I, I sometimes these the those in the diaspora are the ones who will savage some of the things that Africa itself is losing, because they think of pride to serve my my friends palm palm wine if I can afford it because I mean palm wine that I would buy for um, less than a dollar. They want me to pay like five dollars yeah, here for, for something that will not even intoxicate me. Yes, um, thank you uh, so much. You agree that uh, we can go on and on listening to your very fascinating uh, take on food and food making and um, and co consumption. Um, I would like uh, to thank you very much, um, and hopefully we will continue engaging with you. We know that the conference um, is at odd hours for you in the US, but we thank you very much for making yourself uh, yourself available uh, this afternoon. I think we have a few minutes, uh, about now less than 15 minutes to the next session. Um, thank you very much for coming and for participating in this session. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Auditola. <laughs>